Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, uh, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. church happy to see you all here this morning especially if you are a guest with us this morning this is an incredible place to hang out and explore church explore faith explore a relationship with Jesus really glad you're here uh, real fast uh, to introduce myself to those of you who are guests my name is Matt I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor and we are in the middle of a series that I'm super excited about because I believe God is going to do an incredible work through this particular uh, study that we're doing and ultimately what it is, right, we're looking at the power of a story. We're looking at the power of your story and the way that God's story weaves into your story, right? We're, we all love a good story. We talked about this last week. We had an opportunity to look at how the truth is that all of us in this room have a story and that our story is a story that others need to hear. There's something incredibly powerful about the story that God has given to you. So we're taking last week and this week and next week, all leading up to Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday, by the way, we're going to talk about the greatest story ever lived, and we want to kind of just ramp up to that through this series. There's something really, really powerful about a good story. I don't know if you're like me. I like to talk to strangers. Anyone else like that? If, I, uh, if you sit next to me on an airplane, you got, you got a couple options, all right? Put headphones in and I'll leave you alone, or we're going to have a conversation, all right? So I'm that guy, right, who will have a conversation with someone on a plane. If we get in, like, a, if I get in a jacuzzi, you know, like at a resort, and there's someone sitting across, I'm the guy who's going to say, hey, what brings you here, right? Or, I'm, you know, I'm going to start up a conversation. I like talking to people. I like hearing other people's stories, and I love how usually when other people share their story with you, 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 you probably get an opportunity to share your story. I just enjoy that. I wanted to... Um, remind you, right? We had a homework assignment last week. If you weren't here last week, you're behind. You have some catch-up to do, but I'm going to tell you what the homework assignment was. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or show me the turn in the homework or anything, so you're off the hook if you didn't do it, but not really because you still need to do it, all right? And here's what it was. Last week, we talked about the fact that everyone has a story and that we need to be ready. We need to have our story ready to share, we had a homework assignment of going home and putting our story down on paper, right? Writing down our story into three parts. There was before Jesus, then Jesus, and since Jesus. And your story, your testimony of how God is working in your life, if you in this room are already a follower of Christ, you have a story that looks like that. And we challenged each other to go home and write down our story. Now, you're going to see why having that story prepared is going to be really important today. Um, so I want to remind you, if you haven't done that yet, you still have time. Uh, you want to prepare your story. Uh, let me share with you my story. Many of you are, are new in this church, and you might not have heard my story before. So let me share it with you. My, my before Jesus part of my story is, is fairly short because I was lucky enough to be raised in a faith-filled home. Both of my parents loved Jesus. So as far back as I can remember, I can't actually remember a time in my life 
where I didn't know who Jesus was and I didn't understand that I needed Jesus in my life. So as far back as I can remember, my parents say that around five or six, I, I one day called them into my bedroom at nighttime and I said, hey, I want to give my life to Jesus and I, I prayed a prayer and I, I kind of walked through some of that and it wasn't until a little bit later in my life when I turned nine, I uh, made a profession of faith through baptism and, and it wasn't really until my sophomore year of high school that my story took a drastic turn. A sophomore year of high school, my, my mom passed away suddenly. An unexpected uh, loss of my mom. And up until that point in my life, I always thought my dad was the spiritual leader of our family. I assumed that we got up on a Sunday morning because my dad was like, we're going to church. But the reason my dad said we're going to church because my mom said we're going to church, right? And I learned in that season of loss, uh, the, the week and month and years after my mom passed away, that my, my dad wasn't the spiritual leader of our family. My mom had been the, the leader of our family. And what happened was in that moment, I had to decide. My, my dad kind of turned angry towards God because of the loss of his wife and the kind of a little bit similar story for my siblings And I, in that moment, had to decide for myself, I was a sophomore, I just got my driver's license, I had access to a car, do I want to wake up on a Sunday morning and drive myself to to, to big people church? Did I want to be a part of church? And for for whatever reason, I I decided I wanted to, to, instead of uh, you know, the faith that I had up till that point, I believed that Jesus was real. I believed that I, I trusted that Jesus was my Savior. But up until that point, that faith decision I made, I believed all those things because my parents told me that was true, and I believed my parents. I was kind of leaning into their faith. And sophomore year of high school, I had to decide for myself, do I believe that God is good and that he wants a relationship with me? And I, my faith became real, in those months, in the relationship that my youth ministry had in my life and the way mentors were pouring into me, I felt like I wanted to pour that way into other people, and I felt called into ministry early in, or later in my high school career, and I, I went to study ministry, and, and then in, uh, right after, essentially right after I graduated college, my dad passed away from skin cancer, so now I'm like 21 years old, lost both of my parents, and I'm experiencing these highs and these lows with loss of life in my, in my story, and yet I was able to see in all of those examples where God was able to take those situations and what he was doing and how he was taking those things and weaving them into a really, really beautiful picture and a really beautiful story. And when I tell people the story about how God has been a source of hope in my life and how in those moments of, of longing that God was providing the kind of the, 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 the answer to the longing I had within me, my story involves those things. Now the truth is that my story is different than your story. Your story has different things, different elements. Maybe your before Jesus part is really long and juicy, right? And mine is like, I don't got much there. Like, I remember Jesus being a part of my life the whole way for the most part, right? But all of us, if you've made a decision to follow Jesus, you have a story, and your story, just like mine, has a before Jesus, then Jesus, and a since Jesus. And all of us have a, a similar elements in, in those three parts. Maybe your story has a, a, a trial that you went through, or many Maybe you experienced death the way I did. Maybe you lost a loved one like I did. Maybe a miscarriage or an addiction or cancer or something you're still struggling with. Maybe you were abandoned by someone who was supposed to be with you to the end. Maybe your story has brokenness just from bad decision after bad decision. Maybe you were trying to find satisfaction in things that just kept kept you feeling empty. And I, I don't, listen, I don't know what your story looks like, but I do know this. If you're a follower of Christ, you have a story that other people need to hear. In fact, I made you say that with me last week. Can we do that again? We're going to say, I have a story that others need to hear. Let's say it together. I have a story that others need to hear. One of the most beautiful examples of having a story that others need to hear is in Scripture 
And I want to share that with you. But before we get there, isn't it amazing that despite all of your brokenness, despite all of the pain you've experienced, despite sin and struggles and all the ups and downs and everything that's gone on in your life and in my life, that Jesus is going into, he's entering into your story despite all of that. You're not having to chase after Jesus. Jesus is constantly coming to you and seeking after you. And we're going to see that here in this story in John chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, uh, make sure you're bringing a paper Bible with you because we're going to learn how to use these Bibles better together. Uh, We're going to learn how to find things in them. If you don't own a Bible, uh, we want to give you a Bible. The Bible that's right in front of you, you can have that. Just write your name in it for us, okay? So John is uh, the fourth book of the New Testament. So if you're looking at your Bible, about three quarters of the way in, so almost towards the end, you'll find the New Testament the fourth book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John, chapter 4. And this is a story that many of you have heard before. Uh, Some people call this story uh, the the story of the Samaritan woman or the woman at the well, all right? Uh, But I'm hoping to teach you some new things from this story this morning. Here we go, John chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, the first part of this. It says, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Now that's really important. If you like to circle in your Bible, circle the word Samaria, because we're going to talk about that here in a moment. He had to go through Samaria on the way. It says, eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. I love how this really kind of shows the human side of Jesus. He's exhausted. He's sitting wearily aside uh, uh, next to this well. Uh, Circle another word here. Circle the word noontime. This is a very important part of this understanding of what's happening here. So he's in Samaria, and it's about noon, it's the, like the middle of the day. It says, soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at that time, or at the time, because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. So here's what we got here in the first eight verses of this uh, uh, true story. That Jesus is uh, going, he's tired, he's sitting next to this well. His disciples have left, so it's just Jesus hanging out there ne- next to this well. And then a woman from Samaria. Now, why is that important? All right, Samaria was, it was kind of known as a, uh, an area, a, a group of people that nobody liked. The Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. In fact, people would, instead of going through Samaria, which was very convenient, it was actually better to go around uh, Samaria so you didn't have to encounter any of those Samaritans. And yet Jesus finds himself not going around Samaria, but like only Jesus does, right? He goes right into the heart of Samaria. And now he's sitting next to this well at noontime. Why is that important? Let, Let me tell you. If you were choosing a time of day to go do a hard task, like carry something heavy from one place to another, do you pick the middle of the day in the Middle East? You don't. You go in the morning. You go in the evening. You go when basically everyone else would be going to collect water. So the fact is that this woman is by herself going in the middle of the day to collect water shows us a little bit about her. She doesn't want to be around other people, and we're going to find out why. She likes to kind of keep to herself. She's probably carrying something. She has uh, more to her story, and we're going to see that here in a moment. So let's keep reading. John chapter 4, verses 9 through 14 It says the woman was surprised. First of all, she's probably surprised because there's no no one at the well in the middle of the day. It says, for Jews refuse to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, "If if you only knew the gift God has for you 
and who you were speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Essentially what Jesus is saying is, if you knew who I was right now, you would have asked a different question. This is not the question you would have asked. You would not be wondering why I am asking you, a Samaritan woman, for something. You would be asking something totally different. And then he goes on. He says, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? Clearly, guys, listen, she doesn't know who she's talking to. She doesn't realize that she's talking to Jesus Christ in this moment. She says, who, what, who do you think you are? You really think that you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? And you don't even have a bucket. You showed up here at a well without even the materials necessary to get water from this well. Well, and she keeps going on. How can you offer better water than he, Jacob, and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And then Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water from the well will soon be thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. So essentially what's going on here is that Jesus kind of reveals himself to her. He says, listen, if you knew who I was, if you knew that I'm kind of a big deal, if you realize that I am Jesus Christ, you wouldn't be asking the questions you're asking. Right now you would just be uh, like hungry, you, you, you'd long for, you would want to drink of water that you would never thirst again. And he, he reveals himself but not fully. Right? He starts to kind of explain what's going on, but he doesn't go all the way. So this leads me to our first kind of really big takeaway. I want you to, if you're taking notes this morning, a kind of big takeaway number one is that God's story changes our story. God's story, the story of, of God and him sending Jesus and redeeming the world, that that story has the ability to change your story. You at some point as a follower of Christ, Jesus entered into your story and your story became a story of hope, no longer a story of hopelessness. You see, Jesus changes your story. God's story changes our story. In fact, think about this phrase for a moment. I'm going to put it on the screen. When God changes your story, he becomes the main character instead of you. You see, before Christ, before Jesus was a part of your story, the decisions you made, uh, the, you know, every kind of thing you did and what you liked and what you said and what you thought, all of that was focused on you. You were the main character. It was all about you. But one thing that sets apart right, a follower of Christ is that we don't follow ourselves. We follow the leading of Christ. So at some point in your story, when, when God changes your story, you, don't, you are no longer in the position of main character. That, that role shifts over, and now Jesus becomes the main character of your life. His story radically changes your story. You see, Jesus becomes a turning point in your story, and we're about to see, excuse me, how that happened in this woman's life. See, Jesus is about to become a turning point for her. In John 4, Let's keep going in verses 15 to 19. Before we, before we pull, put this verse up on the screen, I want you to hear the first few words of this woman's response. And you tell me whether or not you think she is hungry, or a better word, thirsty for, for something. If there's something missing deep down in her soul, if there's a clear reason why she is sitting at this well in the middle of the day all by herself, because she is longing for something, and Jesus has offered her uh, potentially an answer to what she's been looking for, and here's what she says. She says, please, sir, the woman said. Have you ever read that before with the longing that she must have had in that moment when she said it? I picture this woman in the middle of the day, full of shame. Oh, you're, you're about to find out why. She's got all sorts of baggage in her story. She's sitting there longing, hoping for something that makes sense in her life. And then somebody says, I might have the answer for you. And she says, please, please, sir, 
Give me some of this. And she goes on. Give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Jesus essentially points out to her the reason why she's sitting there at this well in the middle of the day by herself. Listen, we know Jesus saying, you and I both know that there is some, some baggage, some shame, some struggle, some sin, some things going on in your life. And he points those things out, and, and then the woman says, sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. I want you to know that Jesus doesn't point these things out to, to shame her. Jesus doesn't say these things to like point a finger at her and say, ha ha, busted, you're a messed up person, that's why you're here by yourself. He doesn't point these things out to make fun of her, to, to, like call, you know, to, to, to unlovingly just kind of like call her out on these things. He, he mentions these things to let her know and to reveal the power of who he is. You see, not only did he reveal himself a little bit before, now he's revealing himself a little bit more and he's saying, I, I know who you are. I know all the things about you that other people might not know, and, and in your case, probably a lot of people do know, which is why you're sitting here in the middle of the day by yourself. And yet Jesus enters into her story. This is what he's doing. He's saying, listen, I know about your baggage. I know about your sin. I know about the brokenness of your life, and yet I'm offering, I'm walking up to you and and offering my story to be a part of your story, to change your story. And then we see this continue. Let's go to verse 25 to 26. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus told her, there's only a certain, few certain points in Scripture where Jesus just comes right out and says it. This is one of them. He says, I am the Messiah. See, he revealed himself a little bit before. He talked about this water, and if you drink this water, you won't ever be thirsty again. And she's like, wow, that sounds really great. And then he revealed to her who he, the power that was within him and, and told her everything about her life. And then he finally comes out and says, listen, I am the Messiah. You know about a Messiah coming. I want you to know I am that guy. You see, what happens is Jesus fully reveals himself. He tells his story, and his story has the power to change your story. His story in this moment changes her life. His story changes her story. And that's so, that's one of my favorite things about Jesus, y'all. Listen, if you're in this room right now and your story is still before Christ, you have yet to make a decision to follow Jesus for yourself, First of all, I want you to know this is an incredibly safe place to come and explore faith. I'm really glad that you're here. But I want you to know that this is how Jesus operates. You know, a lot of people are thinking, man, I, I can't go into church. I can't be a part of a, of a faith. I can't give my life to Jesus. My life is messed up. Jesus wouldn't want anything to do with me. The truth is that he knows everything about you. He knows every sin, every struggle, every kind of oh, hang up you got going on right now in your life and he enters willingly into your story because he loves you and he wants a relationship with you he thinks you're worth it even though you think you're worthless and Jesus does that for this woman he goes and says listen I know everything about you I know it's not pretty I know that the other women of the village don't even want to be around you but I do I love you. In fact, I can offer you something that's going to fix and, and fill this, this emptiness that you're experiencing, that you've been trying to fill with random men. I'm the only one that, that can offer you a water that's never going to leave you thirsty again. And just the way Jesus did that in this woman's life, I want you to know 
that despite all of your struggles, despite knowing everything about you, despite making the same mistakes over and over again, Jesus willingly enters into your story because he loves you and longs to offer you this living water. So as we keep reading, John 4, 27 to 29, it says this. Just then, Jesus' disciples came back. So now they're not alone anymore, right? They were shocked to find him talking to a woman. See, not only was it weird for a Jewish man to be talking to a Samaritan, but it was also wrong and kind of weird for a man to be talking to a woman in this day and age. So they're shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what did you want with her or why are you talking to her? So in that moment, as these other guys are coming back into the picture, the woman left her water jar beside the well, and she ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Do you see how God's story changed her story? It says that she left her pail of water, she left it right there, and she ran back to the village. A woman who just moments ago was afraid to be around, didn't want to be around other people from her village, is now running into that village and telling everyone about her story. She's telling everyone about the testimony of what happened. That leads us to our second big takeaway. I want you to, to, to write this down. Number two, God can use your story to change someone else's story. So not only does God, God's story change your story, but God can take the story that he's changed and he can use your story to change other people's stories. That's why when I say you have a story that others need to hear, the truth is that you have a story and that God can use your story to change other people's stories. We're going to skip down to verse 39 and show you how this looked here. On the screen behind me, I'm, I'm switching from the New Living Translation to the New International Version. And here, here's what it says in verse 39. It says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's story. Because of her testimony. She went into the village, she told people her story, and many people believed. I want you to know, you know, I understand that a couple means, a two, means two, right? Few means three. Many, what, is, what does that mean? I looked up the actual Greek word, it's the word polis, and it means an abundant number, a great number almost too many to count. The Bible says that the people came streaming. I mean, that word, this is not two people, three people. This is not five people. That would have been easy to say 10 people came. No, an abundant number of people from this village heard this woman share her story and her story. God allowed her story to change their story. Many people believed because of the woman's story. Let's keep reading. In John verse 40 to 42 it says when they came out to see him something really cool is about to happen here i don't miss this when they came out to see him they begged him to stay in their village so he stayed for two days long enough for many more i love that many more all right now not only the many from the original uh, mention but now many more people were able to hear his message and believe and then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us. In other words, now we believe, not just because we heard your story and your story caused us to come to faith. Not only did your story impact our life, but now also, but because we have heard it ourselves. Now we know that indeed, that he is indeed the savior of the world. I love what happens here, because essentially what, what happens is this woman, when she goes and tells the people, she's not even sure in that moment whether or not he is the Messiah. She says, could this be the Messiah? She goes and she shares her story. She tells the people about what happened to her. She still even has some doubt within her, and in just in sharing her story, uh, many people, polis, a multitude of people, come to faith. 
And then what she does is she invites them, right? She says to come and see. And those people come to Jesus here in verse 40 to 42. And they see and meet Jesus for themselves. And now not only is there a faith with a little bit of doubt, but now it says that they know indeed that Jesus is the Savior of the world. So this leads me to a a third really important truth. Number three, God is the story changer. Listen, you can share your story with as many people as you want. You can go out there and share your story, and you should. You need to share your story with as many people as will listen to your story. But the truth is that your story isn't what changes people. The power of God working in you, the way he changed your story, is gonna, he's going to allow your story to be heard by other people, and he's the one who's going to go in and do the work. You see, what the woman did was she just said, let me tell you what Jesus did. And then she invited them. I want you to circle a word for me, a, a circle a phrase. If you like writing in your Bible, uh, do this. If you don't like writing in your Bible, do this. All right. In verse 29, I want you to circle the words, come and see. Essentially what this woman is doing in this moment is she is sharing her story, and then she's saying, listen, this is how God changed my life. And when I share my story, when I'm sitting in a jacuzzi tub and I'm telling someone the story of kind of where I grew up and what's happened and where I'm doing now and how God's changed my life, my story has power within it in and of itself, right? That God can use that, but essentially what I'm doing is saying, listen, God changed my life. Come, you should come and see, and and Jesus can change your life too. See the invitation there. Let let Jesus be the one who changes people's stories. And I love it. She invites people with her story to come and see in verse 29. I also want you to circle in verse 40. What was their response? I love this. It says, when they essentially, came and saw. She invited them to come and see, and then they came out to see. They accepted her invitation, and God's story and the way he worked in her story changed their story. And many people came to know Jesus. You see, we share our story, our testimony, and we invite others to come and see for themselves. And then we let Jesus do the work. We let Jesus reveal himself. Jesus doesn't need us to defend him. Jesus will reveal himself to those who are seeking after him. And our stories open up kind of a door, open up people's eyes to the fact that there is a Jesus worth coming to see. So we, um, we typically wrap up on, on Sundays with a prayer, a short prayer called, What Now, God? And I want to invite you, uh, I don't normally ask you to close your eyes for this part, but I, I want to ask you to close your eyes with me for a moment. And we're going to pray these, this three-word prayer together. God, what now? What do you want me to do in light of this truth? God, we saw a woman who was deathly afraid of being around other people in the middle of the day. God, we saw a woman who didn't have any of the answers. She was filled with doubt. She had all sorts of just baggage and brokenness. And yet you worked your story into her story and your story changed her life and when she went and shared that story with other people God, your story changed their lives God you are the story changer what now God what do you want us to do with this and we pray this together amen church here's what I want to ask here's what I want to ask you to do and this is a really big ask because I think many of you, when I tell you what I want you to do, you're going to be super uncomfortable. You're going to tell me right away, "Uh uh-uh, not going to do it, don't want to do it. And here's what I want to ask you to do. I want you to share your story. Last week, right, you wrote down your story, so you should have a story ready to share. I want to ask you to share your story. And here's why I think many of you are thinking right now, 
I don't want to do that. I don't want to share my story. And it's this. Maybe you don't like the sound of your voice. Maybe you're worried about what other people will think. Maybe you think that if you shared your story, other people would think, wait, what? That guy? Who does that guy think he is telling me about religion or about faith? Maybe you're worried about it ruining a friendship or being rejected or it hurting your career if you share your story. There's all sorts of reasons right now you're super uncomfortable about this, this ask. Can we be a church committed to sharing our story this week? Let me tell you about this woman. Whatever right now, what is the, think about the one reason why you're like, you know what, I don't want to share my story. I don't want to do it. Let me tell you, this woman at the well she was far from perfect, just like you. And yet she dropped her pail and she ran to the village to share her story. This woman did not have all the answers. She did not know how to find things in scripture. She had never been to seminary. If, I mean, she was just a broken, messed up person. And all, she, she, didn't, she wasn't even sure for herself whether or not this was the Messiah. This woman greatly feared what others would think about her, so much so that she avoided people at all costs coming in the middle of the day to get water out of the well. This woman has all the same excuses that you and I have when we are afraid to tell our story, when we're afraid to open up our mouths and tell other people about what God is doing in our lives. This woman has, she, she's like a, a perfect case of why not to share your story. And yet she went and she shared her story. God's story changed her story, and her story, God used it to change other people's stories because God is a story changer. I love that she, she asked people to come and see. And let me tell you how we want to do that. Each of you were given this handout on your chair. You probably are sitting on it, or you grabbed it, and it's on your lap right now. We're doing something really exciting at ACC, and I want to invite you to participate in it. What we're doing is over this next a week, and over the next two weeks, we're putting a storyboard on our website where we're asking you, our church, to participate in sharing your story. It's as simple as this. Watch. You take out a cell phone, you go to video mode, and you hold it up facing you. And for about two minutes, maybe three minutes, you just tell your phone your story, right? Share your story. Like this is, my name's Matt, and this is my story. When I was younger, this, and then my mom, and this, and my dad, and then God is doing, and you share your story. And on here, we have kind of the directions for how to do that. And what we're going to do with your story, check this out. We're going to take your story that you submit to us. It's really easy to use. You just drag and drop. You can do it from your cell phone. You don't even need to be on your computer. Just drag and drop it into our Your Story page. Then we're going to take an invite, a come and see Easter invitation and put it on the end of your story. And then provide it back to you for you to share with other people. You'll be able to, to share your story. Other people will be able to come onto our page and see uh, other stories. Your story will be tagged. So maybe if you struggle with an addiction or, or depression or a loss or a miscarriage or something like that, other people can come to the page and choose miscarriage and see other stories that are similar to yours and be encouraged by them. And at the end of every single video, it's an invitation to our community to come and see for yourself. Come and meet Jesus and let Jesus' story change your story. You have the ability to participate in this. And our goal, by the way, is to have 100 stories on our story page before Easter Sunday. And I want to ask you, because right now I know exactly what you're thinking. Can I tell you? Here's what you're thinking right now. I don't want to do that. That makes me super uncomfortable. I don't like how I look on camera. What if I say something really weird? What if my video is too long? How many of you, just raise your hand, how many of you has Jesus changed your life? The same group of people, how many of you has Jesus changed your life and you know someone that Jesus could change their life too? How many of you 
uh, Jesus changed your life and you know someone who Jesus could change their life and you'd be willing to get a little bit uncomfortable for Jesus to allow them to hear your story in their life. Let me tell you, there's a whole lot less hands right now. So let me ask this question again. Let me remind you first. If Christ, who came down from a perfect heaven to be born in a barn amongst animals, to live a life filled with all the same pain and temptations and struggles and worries and all the same things that you experienced in your life and then willingly died a death so painful on a cross that before he went to go die this death, he, he cried out to God to have God change his mind and was sweating blood for you. If that Jesus was willing to do that for you, shouldn't we be willing to share our story and be uncomfortable and to tell other people about what Jesus has done for us? I want to ask you to consider that this week. Would you be willing to share your story and, and allow it to be shared in a way digitally that we can share those stories all over Glen Burnie? That people all over this community and all over this state and all over the world might be able to hear your story and God can allow your story to change their story because he's the story changer. We skipped a section in John. We skipped a few verses. I want to show you what those say. In John 4, 35 through 36. It says, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. This is Jesus right now. In fact, I want to say this is Jesus speaking to his disciples to you and to me, and this is what he wants to say to us this morning. He wants to say, wake up. I love that. Wake up, church. Look around. 85% of Glen Burnie is far from Jesus. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvesters alike. Church, let us share our stories this week. Submit them. We'll take care of uh, some editing. We'll get it back to you. We're going we're gonna to just let this community know that they are loved and allow our stories to, to be a part of how God is changing their stories. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for being a story changer. God, thank you for changing my story. Thank you for changing the story of my wife and my kids. Thank you for being a part of changing stories all throughout this church. God, I pray for courage. And I know that there are many in this room right now that are thinking, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. Maybe it's too vulnerable or too painful or too difficult or it just requires too, too much courage to do it. God, I pray right now that you would give them a boldness and say, I am right now, I'm going to commit to telling my story, to recording my story. Because other people need to hear it. And God, I believe that my story can change other people's stories because you're the story changer. I love you. We pray this in Jesus' name together. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.